three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Stop. Go Falcon. Go Dragon. Got speed. Axiom one. Together, a new chapter begins. Godspeed AX-1. Stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 38 seconds into this historic mission, flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9. Power range telemetry nominal. Let's listen in to Ed's commentary of this. Ed, talk us through what we're seeing right now and talk us through what comes next. Yeah, so quickly for the audience, Guy, that are viewing on Bloomberg Television, the feed you see on your screen is about 20 to 30 seconds behind real time. So I knew that the launch initially had been successful, but 60 seconds into the launch, we've hit the max Q, the moment of maximum aerodynamic stress or pressure on that vessel. The Falcon 9 has a series of Merlin engines, each of which generate 190,000 pounds of thrust or at their maximum 1.7 million pounds of thrust. And when they hit their maximum speed, they'll be traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. So spare a thought for the crew inside that Dragon capsule who are experiencing that intense G-force, but they'll accelerate through the thickest part of Earth's atmosphere over the next two and a half minutes or so. Well, and Ed, obviously these are private individuals. What kind of training did they have to undergo to be able to join this mission? Fantastic question, Kaylee. Up to 1,000 hours of training. That's how much they had to do. This was not a walk in the park. What they did was essentially replicate, replicate sorry, the training that a NASA astronaut would go through. That is getting in and out of the capsule, how the emergency protocols work, how to wear the spacesuit correctly. But the biggest part of the training would focus on their time on the ISS, working in weightlessness, the sp scientific studies that they'll do, many of which are related to healthcare in conjunction with Mayo Clinic, for example. So it was an intense training program. They had to quarantine for the weeks running up to this launch because of COVID-19. But it ultimately, we're tracking nominally. Everything is looking good. Ed, as they head down range, how far away is the ISS? How long is the journey to the space station? And Miko. Yeah, so the ISS orbits at around 240 to 250 miles, and there you have first and second stage separation on your screen. So essentially what just happened, the Falcon 9 booster fell away from the second stage, which is a smaller rocket, just a single engine, which you see on the right-hand side of your screen, and that is propelling the Dragon capsule. And later on, we'll actually see the capsule uh, separate from that second stage engine as well. So they're getting higher up into the atmosphere, beyond the Kármán line, into the internet nationally recognized boundary of space. The journey guy is 20 hours in total to the ISS orbiting height. But after about 12 minutes, and what you and I and Kaylee will cover now, they basically enter an orbital trajectory where everything slows right down and thrusters on the capsule will give them on that exact trajectory towards the International Space Station. And as we continue to watch these pictures, Ed, it is never short of amazing to see this kind of human accomplishment uh, in space. Obviously, it is a SpaceX a mission. Talk to us about Axiom's role here and how these two are yeah. working together. This is a really interesting dynamic. So how I would describe it, for want of a better expression, is that if SpaceX is the airline, you know, the carrier that's the launch provider, then Axiom is the travel agent. They brokered this agreement between NASA, SpaceX, and the astronauts themselves who paid for the privilege to go up. But their long-term vision is much bigger. They basically want to make the future of space stations commercial. So there's a plan in 2024 for Axiom to launch a new module that will attach to the International Space Station. And as we've been discussing this week, the International Space Station has a limited life. It's due to be decommissioned in 2031 and to be crashed into the ocean. But the plan is to have built it up to a certain extent where there are commercially operated modules or arms of the International Space Station that when it is decommissioned, they can break off and that new generation of private sector space station exists up there. It's part of a much bigger picture plan for NASA to divert the cost burden away from them and towards the private sector. Uh, everyone is still pretty comfy. Ed, uh, if Axiom is the travel agent, how long before it goes mass markets? 
Like, how far away are we from it's mass a... market travel into space? Uh, it, it, this is the billion, three billion dollar question. I mean, Elon Musk has talked about this idea, right, that the launch side of a business tops out at three billion dollars of sales annually. And it's hard to use that guide to understand the volume or frequency or cadence of launch that you would need to achieve a mass market. All we know from Axiom is that this is a a AX1, their first mission, three private astronauts and a pilot from Axiom. They have an AX2 and an AX3, which are sold out, and they're still selling the seats for AX4. But, you know, there's a finite number of people out there who have $55 million to spend on a flight like this. Yeah. Of course, we're aware of the kind of lower spec operation of Virgin Galactic, but I certainly don't have that kind of change to go up. And Ed, on that price tag, which clearly is not uh, necessarily accessible to the average human being, is this the kind right. of thing that as, as the market grows and becomes more scalable, this becomes you know, a more common occurrence? Is that expected to come down or is space flight only still going to be for the choice few? Yeah, it's interesting. I never thought I'd be sitting at Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral talking about the parallels between inflation, commodities, uh, higher price inputs, and space exploration. But the reality is that the most expensive part of a launch is kerosene. The kerosene is not produced on site locally here, and SpaceX have talked about the need to do that to significantly lower the cost. That is the bulk of what it costs to go to space, the fuel, the propellant. We already know that SpaceX has raised prices for its satellite clients for example, which it takes up on the transport emissions because of those higher input costs, both linked to inflation on the component side, but also the energy cost in the development of oil products like kerosene. Ed, has there been any talk of using synthetic kerosene? This is the issue that the aviation industry is having to talk about at the moment. Um, kerosene prices obviously have, have skyrocketed recently, but I'm just wondering, I, from an ESG point of view, how sustainable is space? The nitrogen gas thrusters. It's an interesting debate, and there is no uniform answer. If you take Blue Origin, for example, the space startup run by Jeff Bezos or owned by Jeff Bezos, they use a mixture mixture of hydrogen and oxygen as their propellant. But they're only going to a low orbit. And Elon Musk has spoken pretty plainly, plainly about this. And Guy, you'll have to forgive me because I'm not a rocket scientist. I just report on rocket science. But ultimately, my understanding is that kerosene is the best of the best. If you want to get to 17,500 miles per hour, you want to get to an orbit of 250 miles above the Earth, yep. then kerosene is the best propellant, and that's what Elon Musk likes to use. Ed, you are the closest thing to a rocket scientist, I think, Bloomberg has, and we're very thankful for your reporting on this. You mentioned there, though, some of SpaceX's competitors in this space, Blue Origin, there's Virgin Galactic as well. How far behind are they relative to what SpaceX is doing here? That entry burn helps yeah, that's an interesting question, especially in the context of the conflict in Ukraine, because what the conflict in Ukraine has done has shown that if you take away Soyuz, which is the Russian rocket system run by Roscosmos, SpaceX is pretty much what's left right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, Boeing, United Launch Alliance, Northrop offer launch services, but they don't launch at the same cadence that SpaceX has. They don't price as competitively as SpaceX does, especially when it comes to transporting human beings to the International Space Station, you know, I think it comes in at around $50 million a seat for an astronaut, similar to what Axiom is charging, $55 million a seat for this particular mission. If you look at, by comparison, what ULA is offering or Boeing, it, it's a much higher. And we know that because NASA is transparent in its contract awards and its budgeting through the budgetary office. Um, that is the reality. So now that Soyuz has gone away, you have a large body of private sector yep. satellite creators who are looking to SpaceX as an alternative because they lost their ride with Soyuz. All right, we've got a live view of the crew inside Dragon and Let's talk about the Russians. Right there are Russians waiting for the astronauts that have just blasted off on the International Space Station. Ed, we heard earlier on from yes. NASA suggesting the relations would be cordial. Is that what really people expect here in the long term? What is the future of the ISS? We're beginning to see the, uh, the touchdown now. Ed, just walk us through what's happening on the screen. Yeah, so on the left-hand side, that is the Falcon 9 booster landing on a drone ship in the Atlantic. 
and I'm just giving it a few seconds, but it looks as if that booster was successful, successfully landed, which makes this the 86th consecutively successfully reused booster in SpaceX roster of rockets. Oh, wow. So it's quite a feat, you know, and that's the reality of what's made this happen. Um, Guy, to answer your question, my understanding from the NASA officials that I've spoken to in the last 24 hours is there is every expectation that relations aboard the ISS with the four private citizen astronauts you see on your screen and the three Ros Cosmos astronauts up on the ISS already, they will be cordial. How it works is that it, it is at the discretion of the three cosmonauts, the Russian citizens aboard, to invite not just those four private astronauts, but also the three US and one German uh, astronaut that are already on ISS. And if they want to come over for dinner, they want to float around and have a little gourmet meal, then they can do that, but it's at the discretion of the Russians aboard. the crew here again starting to really getting their first and I'm just I'm just taking a listen here I heard uh, the commentator earlier saying uh, that everybody's still feeling feeling comfortable I mean can you just walk us through at this point in the journey what is left for these guys to do do they just sit and they wait until they arrive at the space station some 19 hours from now preparing for yeah so the, the, the velocity that the, the crew inside the capsule would be feeling and of course I can't even begin to imagine that sensation because I've never felt it but it will be very different from that initial three minutes of climbing because as the atmosphere thins out and you enter the boundary of space, you lose velocity and things slow right down. Eventually, in about two minutes' time, the capsule that's carrying the crew, the Endeavour capsule, Dragon capsule, will separate from that second stage uh, booster. And then from that point, it's literally a 20-hour trip to the International Space Station. And frankly, they'll take time to rest. You know, the stress on the body is to a high degree. They'll have a nap, they'll eat, they'll take off their space suits at one point, they'll don their spacesuits back on, and then in 20 hours' time, around 7.30 Eastern time on Saturday morning, they'll reach the International Space Station.